Welcome to Ear Biscuits. I'm Link. And I'm Rhett. This week, we're still at <laughs> our individual tables of adequate. I don't know, you know if I've got adequate lighting this week. We didn't uh, think but, we were going to be here. Hey, we're both wearing gray t-shirts. Is that yeah, better than being at the day. same dimly lit round table? That's our well, comfort zone? Well, the funny zone? thing is, is we're actually now in contact with one another. You know, we shot GMM together. Uh, so we're no longer social distancing from the t- from each other because we basically have formed a pod between right. our families and now with Stevie. <laughs> but here's the thing. We thought that we were going to be recording this in the studio this week, and we are going to be shooting some GMM in the studio this week, but there's a bunch of construction going on and people in and out of the studio. So in order to minimize risk, we're in here again. So we we lied. We're sorry. Or no, we were mistaken. We were mis- we just wrong. We were mistaken. We were wrong. But you so know what? We're one gonna, more we're gonna one make more the best episode of it. like this. Yeah, hopefully just yeah. this one. Um, it but is my birthday as we're recording this. As with everything else, nothing counts. It's like, I mean, you tweeted. Uh, I appreciate you acknowledging my birthday on Twitter. I will acknowledge that you acknowledge my birthday right it was now. A, it was a mild acknowledgement given the state of the world. I know. You know, it's like we've been through so many milestones here at my home, like multiple birthdays, multiple Mother's Day anniversaries, uh, you know, all types of stuff. And it's just so, it's so hard to to work up the gumption to like try to make it special because it's like, it's you just feel like I'm just going to wait. I'll be. It'll be special again later, you know? And so, I don't know, man. It's, um, and then you compound, you know, we're not just, we're not just living in a world uh, that's a pandemic. You know, we're, we're in crisis here in America, you know? Yeah. Well, so we'll talk about that a little bit because what we're going to talk about when we get into the, the main part of the episode is, we're going to be talking about getting older and not just as two middle-aged men who are literally older now, but just the process of growing up. And we're going to touch on some different stages in life. And we're using your questions to explore that. Looking forward to that. But yeah, so whether you're in your teens, your 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, wherever you are, uh, let's, you know, we've we've been through a lot of it and we anticipate even more. So uh We'll be touching on all that stuff, hopefully. But before we get into that, yes, we do want to acknowledge what's going on in the world. I mean, last week on on Air Biscuits, we were talking about that I wanted to, because of just for my own personal health, to take a news break. Now, wisely, you pointed out at the time that that was really a decision that was rooted in my own privilege of being able to just check out. Um, and since then, and we also, we talked about the, uh, the murder of George Floyd briefly and how that, uh, we had just learned about that when we yeah. recorded the night before. And, um, I had a lot of anger about that. And just over the course of the, the few days after that, of course, uh, protests broke out throughout the nation. They're continuing to go on right now. We've got curfews in place in, in, in Los Angeles and things have really gotten, volatile out there and you know so we're not gonna do i think the thing that a lot of times white folks like to do which is to be like hey let's get together with other white folks and talk about race um i think that would be in one sense that could be a little tone deaf and i think that um we have uh made an effort to you know, as a company, but also as individuals to say some things during this time. But it's difficult. You know, one of the things that I've learned just pretty recently uh, to be conscious about is just the idea of not just doing the typical thing where you kind of come in and say your piece as if what you have to say is super important. I mean, I had a lot of things on my mind and on my heart about what was happening. And it hit me that the most strategic thing that I could do is just talk about a little bit about what I've been learning learning especially from black voices who actually 
understand the history of what's going on in our country and understand why what's happening right now is happening. Um, and so instead of trying to speak my mind necessarily, what I, what I did is I, I wrote a letter to my former self and tried to embody the way that I used to think about these issues, you know, which I was very sure was a just and right and logical way of thinking about them. And I've since come to the realization that a lot of those thoughts were based in my privilege and my, and my whiteness, which is uh, contrary to what a lot of people on the internet will say is not a myth. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll but, just jump in and say, if you haven't read the medium article that Rhett wrote, I'm super proud of the fact that he put that down on paper and, or you can, you can watch him read it uh, or listen to him read it on uh, his Instagram page. So here I am finally promoting your Instagram. Well, and also my Twitter. So you can shout me out on Twitter and Instagram or Twitter. <laughs> I just, deci- I decided to read it because, you know, I, I do, I, I, we talked about this last week as well. I mean, every once in a while, so I, something gets me and I'd like, I have to say something and I'll write a medium piece, but you know, it kind of just hit me. A lot of people don't read, period. And a lot of people don't read, uh, take the articles. time to just read an article. And a lot of people don't want to read something from a YouTube, a guy who's famous on YouTube, which I, I get that, neither do I. <laughs> um, but I. But I thought that by taking the time to read it, I could maybe communicate how personal it was and also get it out there. Because again, it's like, I'm not trying to speak into the culture at large. And I'm not trying to be a voice that is telling black people how they should be acting and reacting to what's going on. Like that's what uh, a lot of white people that I, that I know like to do. But what I wanted to do is, as I said, the only thing that I'm an authority on in this situation is the way that I used to think about this because I was there, it was me. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to talk about, that and so I'm not going to rehash it here, but like Link said, I mean, that's that's my that's what I have to say about the situation. Of course, as a company, we're doing what we can to support the movement to fight racial inequality and injustice, uh, both you know by sp- speaking into it, but also in giving. Um, but I think, and I and instead of waiting until the end of the episode to give a wreck, I want to give my wreck up front because I think that. Rather than listen to us talk about it, uh, I'd like you to listen to a very, very compelling black voice on these issues. And one of the books that was the most eye-opening for me was Stamp from the Beginning by Ibram X. Kendi. So this is a, first of all, thankfully he has two versions of this book, because if you just read Stamp from the Beginning... Uh, it's a it's a it's a long, comprehensive book. It's a history book that covers the history of racism against Black people, starting even before America. But then the majority of the book talks about just the history of racism in America. Now, if you're like us, um, if you're our age, if you're from where we're from, I think we grew up kind of just thinking that, yeah, of course there was racism against Black people. I mean. Back in the day, I mean, of course, I mean, there was slavery and then there was stuff before the civil rights movement. And But I mean, now it's kind of like, I mean, hey, we had a black president. I mean, ev- everything's cool now. Right. And I think that that's uh, not really understanding the depth of racism in America and what that means and what that has meant for black people historically and what that means for black people now. So I heavily highly as enthusiastically as possible recommend reading or listening to stamp from the beginning and if that 19 and a half hour audible book is a little bit too much for you to to bite off he actually collaborated with i think jason reynolds is his name um and did i think it's just called stamped and it's basically the teenage version of the content that's in stamp from the beginning it kind of changes the voice and speaks a little bit in a less academic and more like just speaking to this generation. Uh, and it's a shorter read, but it's just essentially the same content. So stamped by Ibram X. Kendi. And okay, I can get I, into that. I just, yeah. And I would, I would just say again, the tendency, and this has been my tendency for my whole life. 
my tendency is just as un- events unfold in the world is to begin forming opinions about those events and then beginning to spout those opinions off and talk to other people about those opinions before listening and before understanding the context. And if you say things like white privilege is a myth, if you say that there is no racist oppression in America today, A, you're flat wrong. And the only way to learn that you're wrong is to actually learn about the history of racism in America. And you've got to educate yourself. And you and that doesn't mean the U.S. history class that you took in high school did it. Because I took that same U.S. history class and they didn't talk about this stuff. They didn't talk about this stuff to the degree uh, and with the accuracy and the uh, stepping out of the traditional colonialist white perspective in the way that Ibram is able to do. So stand from the beginning. And also I recommended four other books that are kind of come at things from a different angle, but are all great um, in the, in the medium article that you can, I recommend all those and the rest of them are shorter. If you want to try one of those. I've really had to come to grips with the fact that being on the sidelines of this issue is is perpetuating the problem you know there's there are a lot of quotes floating around that are much say it much more eloquently than that but for me um you know i've i haven't denied th- these problems and i'm i haven't you know i haven't sought to actively undermine it by any means <laughs> you know um but i i feel like i've been paralyzed because with a combination of just not being educated enough and not and just being and having fear about deciding to say or do things because you know we're in this environment where if you if you decide to say something you know my my instinct is not to um t- take t- take as little amount of time as possible to like understand something just so I can then turn around and say where I stand on it. You know, I'm very hesitant to take stands on things because I just don't, I just don't have a lot of confidence when it comes to that type of thing. So instead I just get intimidated and just kind of move on to the next thing. And I, I'm troubled by it, but I'm, I'm kind of frozen on the sidelines and I've really come to come to grips with like, that's, I don't want, I don't want to stay there, you know, but it's, and so they're just acknowledging the excuses in order to work through them to say, Hey, it sometimes if you say something and you say the wrong thing, even if you're trying to help, then you're, you you make people upset that you're trying to help, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Or if you put anything on the internet that, 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 that shares something and that implies that you're taking action or that you believe other people should also take action. It's, it just puts a target, you know, no matter what is being said on the internet, if you look underneath it, most likely there, someone is very much opposed to it, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and you, well, and so I wig out trying to anticipate what that is, you know, well, I find and it really it's, interesting. It's, it's, it's that- paralyzing. I find it really interesting that one of the accusations, um, one of the accusations that we've received th- this year, we've become more vocal, right? Obviously, we've become more vocal for a number of reasons. We we became more vocal once we kind of broke the story of our uh, deconversion, deconstruction, and uh, people have perceived that we're you know being more political or talking about issues. I think that those things just happen to coincide in one sense. But it also coincided with 2020, which is a year in which you're not getting political. You're kind of missing the point. Uh, You're not participating if you're not getting political. But I'll say that one of the accusations that we received sort of multiple times is you guys are doing this to like please your audience or let me tell you, uh, uh, everybody, 
We've done nothing but lose audience. <laughs> We've done nothing but lose audience. Once Every time I tweet something that is a little bit controversial, I lose followers. So uh, we're not doing this to gain audience. I, I want as many people to stick around as possible. Uh, but that, that's not what we're doing Doing it. But to speak to what you're talking about with this hesitation to, to, to say something because you feel like you're going to say something wrong. First of all, you are going to say something wrong, right? When you speak into these things, you are going to get it wrong. And, and you don't mean me personally. You're not singling me out, I don't no, think, at this point. Anyone who makes a decision to try to be a part of it is going to get it wrong, and it's just part of the process. But it's also the way that we learn how to do it. And I think you'll be surprised that uh, if you just take a humble posture and you take a posture that is like, I'm here to learn, I'm here to listen, I, if I said that in the wrong way, or if I had an idea that was actually based in some cloak racism that I, I didn't even know if I, ha I had, point that out to me because I, I want to grow. And I think another aspect of that is um, the more that I listen, the more that I learn, the better way to engage, right? And this is a, this is a really recent thing for us. I mean, you know, uh, I think... The way that I have thought and felt about these issues of racial injustice in America has been a has been around for quite some time. But the way that I'm actually interacting and engaging and 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 sort of understanding the depth of the depth of the problem, the persistence of the problem, that's something that's only come, that's not gonna come by just having a conversation with you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Me and you can get together and talk and pontificate and philosophize about everything until the cows come home. And we're never going to understand the situation that's happening in black America, right? The only way you're going to understand that is you have to read, listen to black voices. And so if you're speaking into this, but you haven't read a book like Stamp from the Beginning, you haven't listened to a talk or a video, you, you're not following anybody on Twitter who's speaking from that perspective, you don't have the, you don't have the facts. You can't, you know, you're coming into this with blinders on. And, and it, it took me a long time to, and that's not the, just the case with this issue. That's the case with every issue, right? It drives uh, me crazy. And, and the thing that drives me cr crazy is when I, if you find yourself in the wrong place, you know, on Twitter, or scrolling through the comments, you get barraged, you get pummeled by people who there is, I can discern no love or empathy in their point of view. It's one thing to disagree or to pr make a counterpoint or to come from a different place. But to, but I, that's the one thing I do feel like I can discern, you know, is kind of sniff out like, is there any love any component of love in what you're saying. And I mean, that's why it's deeply disturbing to me if, you know, if if I go to the president's Twitter timeline, you know, I just, you know, I it it deeply disturbs me that I cannot dis, I cannot pick up just a, a grain of of empathy. And what he says, and I mean, you know, it's, I know we don't want, you know, it's like, well, here I am getting into, you know. Best, but hold on, but here's the thing. That's not political. That's just human intuition. I'm, I'm being know. honest with you. Like yeah. seeing the fact that our country is going through what it's going through right now. And we have a president who we don't even want him to speak about it because him speaking about it makes it worse. Like that's unprecedented that we have a president who we do not actually want to say anything because he will only inflame, he will only divide. That's not a political observation. That's just a logical observation about human behavior. I don't care what side of the spectrum you're on, you cannot deny that fact. He is not a leader, he is a divider. He's making it worse. It's the absolute last thing that we need right now. Hopefully, it won't last much longer. So let's let's shift to a to a brighter <laughs> topic of getting older. All right, <laughs> but first, 
Let's let's direct you to the mythical store. Mythical.com has all types of stuff. Do we just sell gray t-shirts? Since that seems to be what we're well, in the mood for today. Well, well, great t- t-shirts in all shapes and sizes. You got a V-neck. It's kind of a baby V. This was your shirt. And somehow I got it. And now it's my favorite shirt. It got too small for me. This is my like... Slowly, um, it, I washed it too many times. It was very clean. The, the, the baby V, I was looking in the mirror today. I was like, Christy, do I look... It makes my neck look so tall. And, look, and my hair's getting bigger. So now I just look skinny. I don't know. Go to mythical.com. Wear stuff that well, makes you I look s- just right. I saw a uh, side by side or an over under of pre quarantine Rhett and Link on GMM and today's yeah. episode that went up. Yeah, I saw that. Recording this on Link's birthday. And somebody was like, well, Rhett looks a little more homeless or whatever the word they used was. And uh, Link looks smaller and skinnier. <laughs> but I looked at it, and I think it's just your hair is bigger, and you're also kind of like turned to the side. So I don't, I mean, I don't think you've lost that much weight in, in, in just a couple of months, have you? No. I lost some weight, and then I gained it back. But I, I might have gained it in a different place than my neck. <laughs> as long as you keep it, keep it moving. Keep it shifting. Mythical.com. That was an ad. <laughs> that was an ad. Okay, uh, let's get into these questions. We'll start with Meredith Gordon. Is a bean fuzz on Twitter. Do you believe in the existence of a quarter life crisis? I'm 37, so obviously closer to having a midlife crisis. But since in quarantine, I've been thinking it might be possible to take the quarantine quarter life crisis intensive and get it done before 40. Yeah, if you're 37 and you're having a quarter life crisis, that means that you expect to be um, 148 years old. If I'm doing the math right. Well, but... She's saying, I'm closer to having a midlife crisis. I don't... Quarter life crisis, I guess, would be like in your mid-20s. But I do... I do know... I don't know about that. I can relate to the fact that like... I mean, being in quarantine, you're... It's it's time for a lot of reflection. And so I've definitely found myself asking, what, what is my life? What am I doing? I mean... I, I would I wouldn't call it a crisis. So so de-emphasizing the word crisis, I do think I've had like a midlife assessment period, and it's and it's there's a lot of question marks associated with that. But it's you know t- turning forty two and um, having time to think about it more. I just feel like okay, we've I've what's the rest of my life going to look like like. I'm looking back at everything we've done. And by the way, we've, and if you listen through a bunch of these episodes, you know, we've lived a bunch of life, man. I'm super grateful. Like we've had, we've had great lives, multiple. We've had multiple you, careers. Had multiple? I feel like we've, we've lived multiple lives. We've had like different careers. And even in this current career, there's been like multiple iterations to it. And, this year, even before the pandemic, it was kind of a transition year for us professionally because we had come off a of touring. We had we'd been ambitious about a number of things, and then it was kind of like a regrouping phase in order to then figure out where we were going next and the things we were going to create next um, in addition to this show and Good Mythical Morning. Um in terms of building the company and oh, on a lot, on a lot of fronts, you know? So it's, I felt like I'm in this midlife mindset even before the, the quarantine. Um, and I'm, I don't know. I mean, can you relate to that? Do you feel like you you're having a midlife crisis? I think that the components of a midlife crisis, and that's why you're probably feeling it. And I'm feeling it too, are, You've been working towards something, and it doesn't have to necessarily be your career. It could just be like you're just trying to get, you're trying to do life. And and there's a certain part of your life where you're really trying hard to do life and to focus and to move things to the next level. And then you start crossing over into this place where you sort of realize that, oh, 
what I was trying to accomplish and kind of set up in my life, it's kind of happened. I have a house, I have a car, I have kids, uh, I have a relatively stable job. And then you start looking over the horizon and you're like, oh, so it's just this. It's just this and it's just more of this and then one day I die. And I think that that mm -hmm. transitional period, like there's a point in your life where when you're in college or whatever, all you're thinking about is what's ahead of you. I got I to figure this out. I, I, I got to make the right decision about what I'm going to do. And then you may, like for us, we, you know, we went through the different transitions to get to the point where we're working together doing this stuff and then constantly trying to just grind and figure it out and build this business and yeah, there was so much scrambling and and yeah, for us, I can be I'm so grateful that we're at a place where you know, um we're enjoying stability even in the face of you know, what's going on economically, relative stability for us, not 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 total stability and I'm I'm still wigging out a lot, <laughs> but but uh, but the ability to have a midlife crisis is a privilege, right? It it it's a it means that you've gotten to a point where you're actually able to stop, step outside of your circumstances and be like, is this huh? all there is? Is this it? Is this it? Yeah. You know, I talked about this book a long time ago. You forced the recommendation out of me, the second mountain. Right. Uh, where it talks about, you know, you work really hard to get up the first mountain. And if you either, you either fall off the first mountain or you get to the top of it. And at that point you realize this can't be my mountain. And I think that one of the things that's coinciding with our midlife crisis, if that's the, I will use that word. You can use assessment. I'll say crisis um, is I think it, there's no mystery in why this is the year that we decided to tell our full story about the lost years. There's there's no mystery why I'm willing to say that the things that I say on Twitter. And it's because I think that this life has got to be bigger than me just trying to be a successful person and make it make it on YouTube or whatever it is that we what we call what we're trying to do, right? It's just like, oh no, actually I, I kind of need to think about the mark that I'm leaving Legacy. a little bit. Yeah. And it's I, I think that you just naturally become so it's all about everyone's gonna have a crisis. The question is just well what what is your response to it? Are you gonna buy a Ferrari? Well I'm not or are going, you just gonna well, become you know, you know what my Ferrari is gonna be because I've been thinking, I've been talking to you about this. I've started looking at hashtag van life. I don't, I don't know what planted this seed in my mind, but I'm like, people are modifying these vans, like these sprinter vans. And like, once you click on one of those on Instagram, Instagram knows you want to look at the inside of people's vans. So I'm, I'm like, man, these people are like traveling around from state to state sleeping and living in a van. They're parking their van next to a mountain lake, opening the back doors of the van and taking a picture from their bed to a lake. I saw this one I, clip. I appreciate And it was somebody, this. somebody had a, they had like a, a GoPro stuck to their forehead and they got out of their bed in their van. They, they scooped up a coffee mug, poured coffee into it, opened the door to the van and it was a beautiful mountain lake. And then they walk out onto this little stone pathway. And then they just, with their coffee, walk on the pathway and just jump into the lake. And I was like, that's going to be the rest of my life. I'm going to get <laughs> one of these vans. And I'm talking well, to you, I'm talking to you to. about it. I'm talking to my kids no. about it. Lando's into it. Christy's like, where's the shower in this thing? I'm like, I think I have to shower outside. Unless well, that's you... the thing. I don't want to. I don't want to be. Well, first of all, I was talking to. I told you about this. Uh, I was talking to my friend's brother who had a van that they were redoing, and he was creating a system that recycled three gallons of water, so you could take a shower inside the van. He was like trying to. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. But he's just a dude, and it, and it's it's him and his wife. I think you this planted the, the seed when you told me that. Well, but I really I believe in this. Um, but I have. I have one hang up for me personally and one hang up for you personally that I don't think no it's a showstopper necessarily. You know me, I'm just a big man and hashtag van life probably doesn't have a lot of six foot seven aficionados. As long as your knees bend, you'll be all right. Um 
But the second thing is, is like you have, a, it's a family of five. So is this a, I'm when thinking the about, kids are gone? I'm thinking about like making a, a cut to the team, you know, <laughs> to make this van life thing happen. It's like, well, are you in or not? Cause everyone's not going to make it. <laughs> the idea of doing van life with my family is not something that I'm into. I mean, I'll do a vacation with them. I'll stay in a hotel. I'm not, uh, I'm not I'm talking about, li- I'm, not, I'm not talking about living in a van. I'm talking about having the ultra luxury of just being able to get into the van every other month and go on like a, an excursion. But you want me to go with you? Sometimes. Yeah, but isn't it just one bed? I'm not I, sharing a bed with you. I'll put You're another- the worst person in the world to share a bed with. And I, I haven't shared a bed with you I don't, since. No, I'm putting another <laughs> bed on top. You can sleep up there uh, in the pop-up, pop-up I need, tent I need to, Just for the sake of the fan fiction people, I do need to finish that sentence though. We used to go to like conferences when we were in college and, and after college where like four college students would stay in one hotel room. And me and you would share a, like a queen size bed in a hotel. And you are not a good bed partner because you I, move I've, a whole I've lot. I said it before. I'll say it again. I sleep with reckless abandon. You, uh, you wake up and your face is right next to my face. So I d- definitely do not want to be a part of that if that's part of hashtag van life. You wait until you see this van. Next question. Ruth asks, uh, that's Ruth Doll 11. Why does time seem to move exponentially faster each year? Uh, um, so, so like when you're a kid, everything goes so slowly. When you're a teenager, when you're like, the more you want time to progress, the less it does. And then the more you want it to slow down, the more it speeds up. I guess I guess that that rings true for me. It definitely rings true for me. I think it rings true for a lot of people. Uh, and so I looked up: Is there any science behind this? This is what an article in Scientific American said: Our brain encodes new experiences, but not familiar ones, into memory. And our retrospective judgment of time is based on how many new memories we create over a certain period. In other words. The more new memories we build on a weekend getaway, the longer that trip will seem in hindsight. In your this van. phenomenon, which Hammond, Hammond is, I guess, the doctor that they're, they're quoting, okay. has dubbed the holiday paradox, seems to present one of the best clues as to why, in retrospect, time seems to pass more quickly the older we get. From childhood to early adulthood, we have many fresh experiences and learn countless new skills. As adults, though... Our lives become more routine and we experience fewer unfamiliar events. Just like I said, you're like, is this all there is? As a result, our early years tend to be relatively overrepresented in our autobiographical memory and on reflection seem to have lasted longer. So it's not that in the moment, like if you sit an old person down and a young person down for an hour, it's actually the probably the younger person who's going to feel like that hour is taking longer. Oh, well, actually, that's consistent with it. But yeah, yeah, it's not yeah. about that. It's really just the fact that you don't have any points of reference. You got to have points of reference. New experience, to memories. It, to me, that that that's the thing. And I think I'm onto this van life thing because I'm so cooped up, and I'm I'm I want to go to parks now. I, I want to get out of the house again, and I want to experience adventure and. Mm-hmm. The, I mean, maybe it's overblown because I'm so cooped up and it'll, it'll dissipate over the, over the rest of the year as things continue to loosen up. But uh, fingers crossed. I don't know. I'm not really making predictions here. But I, I do like the idea of, and we've talked about this in the past, like creating experiences, new experiences that enrich your life. And, you know, I'm a creature of habit. I like to do, I like getting things done honed and and perfected and then then replicated but it's not the that's not that doesn't that that doesn't make for a for the best life necessarily and actually i mean and according to this the more routine the faster your life is going to go the faster you're going to piss it away Mm. and not you don't break up the routine not even remember any of it well, it's funny because, you know, I'm not a routine guy and I'm actually noticing uh, like so I, one of the things I've done consistently 
because we haven't had to go into the office every day. And so we're not getting, I'm getting up early, but I'm not having to get on the road at the same time every day. Yeah. Is that I'm meditating and I'm working out. And then I'm actually like able to walk probably with like with Jesse at the end of the day. Um, but it's getting tougher for me because it feels like I go and I like get up, stretch, meditate, work out. Yeah, it's the same smooth, old thing. Do my smoothie. And then I'm just like, I got to eat something different. Like it takes me about three weeks and I'm like, I've had this smoothie for three weeks. And it's like, I start getting stir crazy. I'm like, I got to have an oatmeal. I got to do, I got to, I got to do something else to, to mix it up. But the thing you're talking about, this, this cooped up thing. So I think, I don't know if I made this a wreck. I should have made it a wreck, but I, did I talk about the book Underland? Did I talk, yeah, did yeah, I yeah. make that a wreck? So when I, and I, and I was at the beginning of quarantine, I was doing this exercise where I was sort of figuring out what my values are. And I don't mean that in like a family values kind of way. I was just like, what, how, how do I, what do I want my life to be kind of represented by and what do I want to be present in my life. And adventure was one of the things that I wanted to be present in my life, right? I have a sense of adventure. You do too. Um, but when you get super busy, the opportunity or the, the sort of scheduling adventures can sometimes go by the wayside. And what I found is that I'm just waiting for an opportunity for a vacation, not anymore, but before quarantine, it was like, oh, Jesse, let's go spend a weekend in a hotel. And what we'll do is on Saturday, we'll just lay by the pool. And I kind of discovered this like five or six years ago. And I was like, this land next to a pool and reading on vacation, that's where it's at, right? But I started realizing that we were doing things like going to Cabo for a weekend and laying next to the pool. And of course, it's like beautiful and I love the company. And... um Great food, you know, great drink, whatever. Starts to blur together. You're also like, hold on, but like right outside the grounds of this hotel, there's probably like a cave that I could go into. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and the the th- thing I told Jesse is I, I was like, when we travel from now on, I really want to make sure that we've got a, a balance of adventure and relaxation because you, you don't want to just go and just run yourself ragged on a vacation but to really think about the opportunities for adventure that present themselves in any given location. Or, you know what, um, adventure in your own backyard, you know? Um, yeah, you don't have to travel to do it. I'm not, yeah. But I'm just saying that I haven't even seen travel as primarily about adventure. Like, you know, we went to France a few years ago for that film festival and had it. We actually did. The, what's the one thing you remember about that trip? What's the one thing you tell people about that scooter. trip? scooter. Get, almost dying on a scooter, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like, because we made a choice for adventure. That was the right choice, man. That'll make, you, that'll make your life short or long. I can't, I don't, I didn't understand your science. Next You question. might die, but it'll make it make your life longer. Grace Anna tweeted, I turned 17 in just a few weeks and I couldn't be more ready for my birthday and being one year closer to adulthood. But I feel like being so eager for adulthood is almost wrong. Everyone I talk to about this says adulthood is awful. How should I feel about my impending adulthood? Adulthood is awful. <laughs> no. I mean, I, I, I seventeen. Lily seventeen. It's like, I mean, I I understand. You talk about being cooped up. There's like a certain freedom of like wanting to get on with your own life. You know, it's as a parent, I. What she, her question makes me just think about how, how, I, how I look at my family. I'm starting to think as Lily's 17, Lincoln's 15, Locke is 16. You know, you start to think about them just months down the road of like leaving the house. They're going to be on their own, you know. Um, it's definitely another part of aging for me. I'm kind of co-oping her question for me as a parent, but. I start to think about things like when when my kids get out of the house, what 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 are they going to come back to? You know, when they a van apparently <laughs> when they they're going to come back and there's going to be a foundation and a van on it. You know, am I am I building a a lifestyle for me and Christy that is not dependent on kids and it doesn't revolve around our kids, but also 
build build a future and start to have dreams that my kids can enter back into, but it's not all about them. You know, that's I I that's the that's the next phase for us, right? And I mean, well, the best way to keep Landon's it not about 10, them. So the best way to keep it about not about them is as soon as they leave to go to college, you turn their room into something else. It doesn't even matter what it is. It could be a gym. It could just be just where all the the socks that you that you can't max match are. You know what oh, I'm saying? Wow. Just d- take their bed, their desk, their posters. Get rid of it all because you want to be very clear about it. you will not live here after you graduate college. So don't get any ideas unless you want to sleep on a bunch of mismatched socks. That's my plan. But I start to think about like, am I going to live in this house? Is this the house that Lincoln is going to come back to with his, you know, is this the house that they bring their partners back to? You're the significant others. Hey, mom and dad, you got to meet Derek. I don't know. I'm predicting there's going to be a Derek involved. Jesse and I have... We we've kind of made this decision that no that, that our current house will not be that house. Mm-hmm. We we are also like we like change and I mean I'm surprised we haven't moved already. But uh, I think that at this point we're like we're committed to staying in this location until Shepherd that that which is like he's 11, so seven more years until he goes to college. So maybe while they're in college, we'd be like, hey, let's try something else. So, and I don't know, I haven't yeah, I thought about that. my the, the child psychology because I know kids like to come back to something familiar. Um, so I don't know, There's I haven't thought about that I aspect mean, of it. Even seven more years in this house, and th- I, I do start to think about that too. It's like, I know that there'll be a lot more memories in this house, and but there's also not a there's not a lot of room for someone for additional people to come back to, you know? Yeah. But I do start well, to think about but, that. But to directly answer Grace Anna's question very yeah. quickly, uh, you should feel incredible about your, imp- it's, it's age 17. Good. Listen, the peak of your life is d- right over the horizon. <laughs> I mean, listen, you've got, Right now, at age 17, there's a bunch of things that are about to coincide. Your level of passion for things and your level of freedom are about to combine in a beautiful synergistic explosion, okay? And you need to realize that. Don't don't wish it away. You, you, You have this incredible opportunity to just... Not have a whole lot of responsibility. Get a van. Yes, get a van. Are we talking about a gap year here? Is that what you're talking about? No, no. I, well, first of all, gap years are becoming very common because of quarantine, because of the coronavirus. The whole world is in up. a gap year. Right, but no, a gap year, yes, but I'm just talking about the fact that you're going to feel like college is a lot, but just let me tell you, it's not. <laughs> It's just, it's like, don't, I mean, I'm not saying don't study. I'm just saying that don't fall for the lie that it's a lot. It's freedom. It's free. And, and not everybody goes to college, but what I'm saying is you're before that, you got this gap between being under your parents' roof and then being, having a roof with other people under it. There's this window. That's the window of opportunity. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just see it for what it is. Just see it for what it is. Enjoy it. Uh, newest X Suite. There's no name associated with this, but that's the handle. It looks like Lewis, but with an N. What do you think is a turning point for becoming an adult? I'm currently 18, but my life hasn't changed that much these past years, and I can't see myself as an adult. Is it getting a job, a degree? Or is it just a matter of age? Um, Kennedy at Kennedy Giro, Giro uh, kind of adds to this question. At what point in your life did you feel like you actually had a good handle on things? I just graduated college and I will start my first big, big girl job soon. And I'm very overwhelmed. It's like trying to figure out what, when, it, when are you an adult and when do you feel like you have a handle on things? I mean, I've said before that, yeah, Christy's back there. She's 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 mouthing never. 
I said, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, I think I've thought before, I felt like, I've said before that I feel like I'm an adult when I had responsibility. Definitely having kids made me feel like, oh, well, I'm not the kid because now I have one. That must make me the adult. But it was something that I kind of had to stop and derive. Well, yes. I, to me, I think the moment that you become an adult is when you have the realization that no one has a handle on things. Ever. Like, it's the moment in which you, which it's like, all of a sudden, you look around and you're like, oh, 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 oh. they also don't know what the hell they're doing. This is great. They're all faking it. They're all faking that they've got it figured out. That's the moment you become an adult. Because when you're a child, you look up usually because you're short and you see these adults and they just they seem like i mean they're moving their in very shirts purposeful are direction in, britches yes and they're like they're like cranking up cars and like jogging and bringing in food they're yeah. doing lots of things yeah. that seem purposeful that make you feel stable but then when you become that person and you're like i'm kind of just doing what they did but hold on I don't really know what I'm doing. I feel overwhelmed. I don't have a handle on things. That's the realization. That's when you become an adult. Well, Lisa at Bleed Blue Bergen tweeted, one of these usernames are crazy. Uh, Lisa said, I think this quote would be a cool topic point on getting older. This is from Alden Nowland. Nowland, never heard of this guy, have you? No. The day the child realizes that all adults are imperfect, he becomes an adolescent. The day he forgives them, he becomes an adult. That's an eloquent way of saying the same what thing we're we were about. saying. That there's a level of maturity um, associated with realizing that no one is, everyone's imperfect. Nobody's got everything figured out. No one makes the right decision. Everybody's in need of forgiveness. And if you can give that, I, I think that's a, I think that's a good measuring stick for 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 adulthood, for maturity. If you if you can forgive people and probably forgive yourself too, and give yourself well, and and just say, hey, we're all just we're all just we're all stumbling forward in time towards our own demise. But we might as well live it up in the meantime. Because an another aspect of it, I, I don't remember exactly the the moment that this hit me, but there was a moment in which. I found myself living through a personal moment in my life that coincided with the first memory of my parents. Does that make sense? So when I started realizing, like, I remember, like, seeing my parents be parents. There's a moment that I can remember my parents doing parental things. Mm -hmm. And then there's a moment in which you see yourself doing the same thing and that's when you can begin to get to that point of forgiveness. You're like, damn, it's hard to be a parent. Mm -hmm. You have sympathy for your own parents. I, and you know, and even though it doesn't help, I tell my 16-year-old this all the time. It's like, I can't wait till you have your own kids. I mean, that's Cliche. a pointless th thing to say. And I shouldn't say it. I say it in frustration. But it's also true because there will come a time, I'm hoping, that there will be a phone call or an email or at least a text that is just like, okay, dad. I get it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just to, and I think that's the moment. That's another way to kind of gauge adulthood. You don't have to be a parent. It, it could be uh, well, let me ask any you this. stage of life where you can relate to another generation. Did you ever have that moment with your parents where you were like, you know what? I get it. It's funny today. Uh, you know, I talked to my mom. She, she wished me a happy birthday and she was like, well, I want to know, do you feel old as dirt? And I was like, uh, I laughed mm -hmm. and she was like, when I turned 42, I remembered that you told me, man, mom, you're old as dirt. <laughs> so now <laughs> that she you're held 42, that. do you feel old as dirt? And she, she said she remembered it, you know? She's been waiting She's all been these waiting years. waiting all these years. Um, I don't remember saying that to her. I'm, I'm sure it was a joke. She, she basically said it was a joke, but do you... I mean, there is an aspect of aging that is you you talk to your parents differently, you know? I mean, was there a point where you've 
just the way that you were what you're waiting for Locke to to text you and say, you know what, I get it. Do you recall giving that to your parents? The way that that comes out for me is, um, I mean, I don't do this all the time, but um, I'm not necessarily great at saying it. Uh, I'm pretty good at writing it. And so in, in a number of cards over the years, whether it's Father's Day, Mother's Day, birthday or whatever, um, and again, I'm not super consistent in this, but I've definitely have specific memories of sitting down and being like, I'm going to write how much I appreciate the, you know, how my mom mothered me, how my father fathered me, uh, because I get it. Like I, you know, understanding how meaningful it was to have my dad present for all my sporting events and stuff like that. And growing up and realizing, damn, that's really hard to do. Like that took intention and sacrifice. So, so and acknowledge, so acknowledging say, that in cards is what you've done. Yeah, That's I mean, good. I'm not saying we haven't talked about it, but I'm saying that I, in some fashion, even though I'm not the best communicator, I have communicated that to them. I mean, as I, I've I, older. I remember one time when I was in college, my dad had a camper and he took it to Jordan Lake, and me and my dad. This was like the first time ever that m- me and my dad like did a camping trip, like sleepover thing where it was just, just the two of us. And I remember we were sitting out there at Jordan Lake and we cracked open a beer. We like shared a beer. Well, we each had our own beer. And I, I just remember that being a, a, a milestone moment. I remember being nervous going, I was like, I'm driving out here meeting my dad. You know, I, I never live with my dad except in like visitation situations. But it was really cool because like all of a sudden we were just we were two guys doing things that we would both do with our friends, but we were doing it with each other. And we were having a conversation that we would each have with a friend. And Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a long time coming from me and my dad, you know, because uh, we never lived together. There are elements of that with all of my kids, you know, like I try to speak to them. I talk to them about things and I talk to them in ways that that I would talk to you sometimes, depending on the subject matter, right? Um, I There are these parents who they never stop baby talking their kids, even when they're adults. Like I, I know of people, I'm not, I'm not close to people, but I've observed people who would still talk kind of like baby talk to their you know, their their daughter or son that's in their 20s. What? Yeah. I'm thinking of one person in particular that you, you but you don't know them. Well, we need to talk about this after because I don't know who you're... There's parents who never change how they talk to their children. And it's, that's just, that's just not good, it seems like. I never know? baby talked either of my kids. I just baby talked the dog. I figured that she can take it for her entire life. But, but you know, I look forward to having an adult to adult relationship with my kids. That's why I like to picture them once they leave coming back and whether it's here or somewhere else, like I want to create an environment where they want to be a part of me and Christy's lives. Well, you know, the way to do that, the the way to do that is probably a beach house. Yes. You, you get, you either get a beach house if we're so you know, blessed to be able to afford one or you rent a beach house and you taking your adult children on vacation. That's how you keep them. That's how you keep them around because they are not going to be able to afford their own vacation. They're all going into a, a this world that's going to be all the robots are going to have the jobs. I mean, they're going to want to go on vacation with you forever. Yeah. They're, so, they're going to want to, they're going to want to like, take the hibernation pill and then only wake up for hibernation to go for vacation with the, with, right. with me and then just hibernate again. I, and I think that what we're going to do and, and we'll be, we'll still be making content on some level. Maybe we'll still be making this, this podcast. I think that we need to commit right now that we're going to be the parents that they want to go on vacation with. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to think about it. You got to, you, you, there needs to be a survey or something. I mean, we got to do like a kid's focus group to be like, what makes going on vacation 
with people miserable and make sure that we're not the ones contributing to that. Yeah. Whatever that is, let's commit to that. Because just as because somebody's got the ability to pay for your vacation doesn't make the vacation fun. No. Okay. Those are two completely different things. Yeah. All right. Erica with a K. Erica, very active, mythical beast. Um, she's got a, I mean, she, her question was so intense and so long that it took two tweets. Looking back at myself in my 20s and even early 30s and realizing that many of my opinions and viewpoints were still being formed by my parent. I feel like I didn't start forming independent thoughts until later in life. When do you think you start truly having opinions and views that wouldn't necessarily be approved by your parents? Do you think the need for approval from such major influences, parents, slows down progressive changes in societal issues? Whoa! This is a big one to get into right here at the well, end. Well, let's just say yes. She asked you. <laughs> yeah, that's my answer. Yes. Um, Hashtag your biscuits. Let us know what you think. No, we're going to answer it. So, you know, when we talked about the lost years, we kind of told our life story and that we were raised in a very particular sort of way of thinking. And we don't think that way exactly anymore. Um, and first of all, that's a super common thing, not just today, but that's been a super common thing throughout the history of the world, especially, you know, post-industrial revolution. There's lots of societal generational changes that take place pretty quickly. And the older generations is like, back in my day, we didn't think like this. And, but so anyway, and also most child psychologists suggest that a child sees a structure and and most kids need to sort of rebel through that structure, even if they kind of come back to it. Right. And, I, and Jesse and I were talking about our personalities uh, and we are both rule followers. Right. I'm a three in, on, on the Enneagram. I'm, I'm a performer. But one of the great ways to kind of exercise your threeness is to recognize the how to succeed within a framework and then be like, oh, I can do that. That's why I did well in school. I did well in sports. And I was a good kid that made my parents proud, right? I was really good at that. Jesse's a two on the Enneagram, which is not about achieving, but it's more about helping people do things and, and, and uh, basically being there for people. But in the same way that she, she's a rule follower. So we got well into adulthood, into our 30s, still holding very tightly to basically the things that we had been taught and our parents had taught us. But we were also then talking about a, a guy that we went to high school with. I'm not going to name his name. That was a friend of ours uh, who also like went to church with us. But then all of a sudden, you remember this, prom one year, junior year or senior year, he showed up. In a dress. Dressed, but not just dressed as a woman, like... He had on makeup and he had done his hair and it, and it almost was like so well done that the first thing I thought was, who's the new girl? Right. I, re I remember thinking that. And then the second thing I thought was, that's so and so, so and so. And at the time I was like, oh, that's a funny joke. Like it, I wasn't like, oh, I can't believe he did that. I remember just thinking that like that was really bold and like very funny. Like that's that like he really pulled that off. But I didn't stop and think. Why did he do that? Right now, as we grew up a little bit, I, I, re I realized that, oh, he was making a statement. He checked out. He rebelled against the system that he saw in place at the time. He just did it in high school. And then he went off to college and became, and became an adult who was somebody that didn't hold to the same worldview as his parents. But it took me to get to in my 30s before I began to investigate the worldview, right? And I'm not saying that th this isn't really a truth, non-truth, whether it's true or not. That's not what I'm, we talked about that a lot in the last years. This is more about like the way that you think and the way that you see the world. Have you ever made it personal, right? Because you yeah. may just, it, you may transfer the same exact worldview that was handed to you by your parents and make it personal and actually passionately interact with it. Uh, but usually the process of actually wanting to kind of take control and make it your own, one of two things happen. You grab hold of it and it slips out of your hand. And you realize that's not for me. Or you grab hold of it and you realize that it fits your hands perfectly and you adopt it. 
But different personalities make that decision at different times. I kind of got all the way through my 20s still in a very performance oriented mindset where it was about making my parents proud. And and that's not every, and I think Erica is saying that she's the same kind of person. My wife's the same kind of person, but a lot of people, including the guy we're talking about who we went to high school with, you know, it happened earlier for him. Yeah. I think for me too, it was, I just, I want to, I want to, if you tell me the right way to do it and enough people agree, then it's just, this is just, this is the safe, secure path. And I'm going to, I can feel okay. I can feel confident. And it's, I didn't have this sense of needing to discover myself or express myself um, in a way that was counter to anything that I was, that the plans that I was adopting, you know, I just, I just want to, I just want to feel okay. I just want to feel safe. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to feel like I'm, I'm out here on a limb trying to figure this out because, and I just didn't have, I didn't have that drive. I had another drive. I had a drive for security. And, um, so so yeah, it was, I think it, it did take a, a, a long time for me to start to figure out who, who I was for me and not for anybody else, you know? And then if you, you know, we got married so young that you transfer from, okay, this is, this is, this is the family that I grew up in. This is the system that works there to now this is the family that I'm, that I've formed. And, you know, I, I got to meet Chrissy's expectations. She's got to meet my expectations. It's like, you know, you go from one to another, at least we did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, into in the, the second part of the question about, Do you think this slows down progressive changes in societal issues? I mean, definitely it does. But, and I'm not, listen, I didn't study this. This this is total Rhett pulling it out of his ass, which is a good bit of what I say. Um, But my theory on this, the way that I think about like societal progression, right? Because I I do. I mean, I think one of the big changes in worldview that happened like when I was a evangelical Christian, I saw the world as getting progressively worse, right? And because that's consistent with eschatology, you know, the idea that things are going to slowly get progressively worse and then Jesus is going to come back, right? Now that I'm more, I, I don't believe that anymore and I'm more progressive in my mindset, I actually think that the world is getting better. And I actually think. If you read Steven Pinker's uh, latest book, I think the facts are on the side of it actually, even though it seems more chaotic and you're getting a lot more information that makes it seem, even right now with riots happening throughout the um, throughout the nation, you may be, oh, everything's going crazy. Well, in reality, basically every marker that you can measure, society is getting better over time, right? So I think the facts are on the side of things are progressing. But what I've always said is that stretching progression like you know social progressive stuff is like stretching the fabric of society right and it eventually fills in and you stretch it and i think that people only have so much capacity for change it's like you pull it you pull it too hard and sometimes it rips and then you got to stitch it and you got to keep pulling I, I'm just, I believe that you keep pushing things in the right direction. And to me, it's, it's just a good segue to zoom out and say, yeah, I, I feel like with what's going on right now, we're at such a pivotal moment in history and such a, it's such an important moment in time that we can choose to be on the sidelines, be part of the problem, be a part of the solutions, be a part of the the evolution the positive evolution of society and i do have hope that as to bring it full circle as we listen and as we have open minds and open hearts that 
it's a it's a privilege to have the opportunity to be a part of of what's happening now and it's it's scary and it, there's no clear path forward on a number of fronts um you know what do you think about racial injustice what do you think about the environment where you think about um this pandemic you can add things to the list but we're 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 a part of it you know and we can we can impact it and we can we can do that stretching and i you know i'm i'm choosing to 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 find hope in that and to to find a way to be a part of it and to to move forward and not just try to escape or ignore or just get old <laughs> yeah well you know and i think that you were talking about earlier the aspect of feeling like you're standing on the sidelines sometimes uh, and i think everybody probably has a tendency to feel that way i the way that i've kind of seen my role in this stretching of societal fabric over the course of my life is that first of all you know my personality is one who is naturally going to grab onto the blanket. I'm going to grab onto the fabric. That's just the kind of way I live my life, right? And I spent a good portion of my life pulling on pulling on one side of that fabric, trying to keep it in place. And I feel like one of the things that I'm doing in the second half of my life is saying, you know what? I actually feel like I was wrong. And I'm moving to the other side of the blanket and I'm pulling on it. And it's I, that's kind of the way that I see the two halves of my life and the way I've kind of contributed to the this what you know what Erica's kind of talking about, these bigger societal issues. Um and so in some ways I kind of feel like I'm making up for things. That's just I don't know if that's right or wrong, but that's that's how I interact with it and I don't think, and I do think that there was sort of this middle period where it was kind of like, all right, I kind of, let me just, I'm going to let go of the blanket. I'm letting go of the fabric. Everybody's pulling on. I'm going to just watch for a little bit. And then once I was like, okay, I think I know which direction I want to pull. I've just been pulling it harder. Yeah. I mean, in the context of aging, we've talked about like being engaged. I mean, you can, you can let life pass you by. As they say, you can let life happen to you or you can happen to life. You know, I think that's the thing that I want to, I want to be engaged. I want to be happening to life and not life just happening to me. Um, life throws a lot at us and there's things, but when you respond, we, we, we do have the ability to engage. And I think that that's, again, that's exciting. That's a place where th th there's hope in that. Yeah. Well, and the, and the last thing I'll say is I think that the biggest difference with the way that I engage about these things, just, you know, and, and, and specifically like the issue of racial injustice, right? I think that I spent a good portion of my life thinking about what I had to protect personally, right? Mm -hmm. Like what were my rights and my interests and how do I hold tightly to those and how do I protect those? And I think that one of the biggest changes that has taken place over the past decade is trying to think a little bit less about what I have and what my rights are and think about people who have been marginalized, people who have been denied rights, people who have been denied opportunity, people who don't have the same opportunity that I have and think, oh, okay, I kind of want to realign my actions, the way I give, the way I spend my time and the things I say and who I vote for to, you know, take those people into account rather than just think about what I have and what's mine and what I can protect. Mm -hmm. And that may be an oversimplification, um, but it's been helpful for me to see, to, to see it that, see it that way. And I think it, it, it's a good sort of North star. It's like, are you thinking about yourself or are you thinking about others? Yeah. Cause you only got one life to live unless we have more that I don't know about. 
you, you won't know. And, and if you do, you probably won't remember it <laughs> unless you would, unless you adhere to a particular faith system that recognizes that. And then you like do some sort of exploration of your past lives. But who's to say that you'll be able to do that? You might find yourself in a worldview that denies that and you'll miss out all the opportunities of living your, your subsequent lives. <laughs> Hashtag gear biscuits. Um, <laughs> if anything we've said, except for the very last part, even that, I don't care. Uh, has, yeah, uh, even that, man. Has given you something that you that you want to weigh in on. Please do that. Uh, let's keep the conversation going. And I look forward to maybe not not being in separate places for the next Ear Biscuit next week, but we will speak at yeah, you next Yeah, fingers crossed. Week. And thanks for your questions. As always, you're contributing to the conversation. Let's carry the conversation on on the internet. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.